like to welcome everybody to the November Public Works Committee meeting. Roll call, please. Alderman Leahy is absent. Alderman Lockmiller? Here. Alderman Parker Tice? Here. Alderman Wagner? Here. Yeah. We'll move on to approval of the agenda. Um, I don't <coughs> think we were able to pull up the minutes, technical difficulties, and the consent agenda, so. Um, let's see. Is there any objection to approving an amended agenda, leaving out the consent agenda? Nope. nope. By acclamation, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Move on to, we have no announcements, appointments, or proclamations. Move on to item number four, which is citizen comment. Anybody from the audience have something they would like to bring to our attention? Three minutes. You'll have another opportunity later. Close citizen comment and move. Oh, there's Alderman Leahy's here. Move on to reports of uh, committee chair and alderman. I have no report. Alderman Leahy? No report. Alderman Tice? No report. Alderman Wege? Um, just wanted to thank Lisa and everybody for, for all their flexibility helping Brentwood barbells out. So I really appreciate that finding a solution on that, so thank you. City Administrator, any report? No report. Uh, item number seven would be department reports. I believe we have some things from our parks department. That'd be Eric. I think there were some requests of you last meeting, Eric, regarding some issues. Yeah, I have a few reports, and actually I have like one late add-on if you guys don't mind. Um, so the first, uh, I have a couple, like I said, a couple reports. The first is um, I was asked to update, investigate what happened to some no overnight parking signs that were used to be installed around Russell. Um, so that was a, a quick mystery to me. Uh, when I first got here in 2007, I didn't see, there was no signs on Long Russell. There was no overnight signs for not Long Russell. Uh, so the first thing I did was look at Google Maps because they have a, a way to kind of go back. Um, you, it, so I went back, it goes back as far as 2007, and again, I couldn't find them. So then um, I went and talked to some employees in Public Works. Obviously, we have some long-standing employees in Public Works. Uh, one employee uh, stated that they were instructed in about the mid-2000s to remove those signs uh, by someone on the Board of Aldermen because the residents were complaining that there were too many signs on Russell. Many of them were uh, redundant. So that's what I discovered about why those no overnight parking signs were that's a quick update on that one. Any questions on that? Andy? If I may, I believe the ordinance is still in force or in place. That was never changed. And yes, an alderman did request those to be removed without going through committee or the board. I would love to have the city confirm that the ordinance is still in place. And if so, the signs be returned so that there is no overnight parking in those down by the park. Would this be a public safety? Well, um, it could be either place, and the reason why I say that is because Public Works actually puts out all these signs, and if you read the code, Public Works does um, provide report to this committee, so this committee could easily do it, but you also have the option to you know, send this to public safety for consideration. Um, well, do you want to make a motion then to Yes, I'd, love, I'd like to, have, to make the motion that the staff do research to confirm, A, if the ordinance is still in, in place. I believe they'll find that it is. And B, if so, then the sign should be there so that you at least make the public aware of the requirement instead of just, oh, surprise, here's a ticket type of range. Second? No second. All in favor of the motion say aye. No. Aye. aye. Anyone opposed? Check in there for us here. Sure. Um. The second thing I was asked to ask about or investigate or to provide a report on is why the trash cans were moved along Russell. And again, uh, we removed the trash cans along Russell in about 2016 after an ordinance amending section 225.040 and 600-040.040 uh, of municipal 
code, which allowed alcohol in Brentwood Park was changed. Uh, prior to the amendment, softball teams would actually go up in Long Russell to drink because they weren't allowed to drink in Brentwood Park. Uh, once we changed the ordinance, all the softball teams uh, started drinking basically in the park. And so and we didn't have all those, the teams drinking up on Russell. When that happened, what we started to notice is that there was less trash in the trash cans, um, that there were still trash in the trash cans, and what they had to empty uh, were things such as engine parts, oils, and uh, paint that hadn't been properly disposed of items that really should have been called into public works for households, uh, electronics such as uh, televisions and computers, and uh, my favorite, which is guts and entrails from hunting trips. Uh, and so basically these are items that couldn't be properly disposed of in landfills. And some of the weights of these items actually led to uh, a back injury for a staff member. So once we did that, obviously this stopped. Uh, we haven't noticed a whole lot of uh, trash along Russell. The, the minor stuff we did, staff picks up on uh, whenever they see it. Um, and so that's why we've done it. Uh, we've only received one complaint since then. And so, and so that's, that's the reasoning for it. So um, that's the update on that one. The, re the request is to at least have two ca trash cans along those parking areas. A, you do still have people that are parking and using the park and still drinking out at the street side, but B, when you're walking the dogs and picking up after them, there's no place to put the poop. So if the cans were there, at least uh, you would encourage the dog walkers to do it. Not all dog walkers go down into the park itself, because when the ball teams are down there playing, they don't want to bring the dogs around them, so we walk the perimeter of the blocks. The trick is, is if the cans can be there, that's convenience. And yes, I do understand you're gonna always have somebody that's thinking they're beating the system by throwing something in there that they probably shouldn't. But at least the city then, hey, we do the right job of disposing of those type of things properly instead of pitching them where they shouldn't have been. And if they're at least using them as trash, then yeah, the can's doing what it was designed to do, help us collect it to keep the rest of the area clean. I think, I think it's reasonable enough to put, to put them back out. Just for the convenience, you've got a city park collecting of waste so that it doesn't end up on the ground in the parking spaces, but to be used type thing. I think re removing them, I understand why, but I don't, I don't think it's the right move for the city to take. You've provided, I think there are 32 parking spaces along, or 60, if you do the whole thing from the thing. If you want people parking and using them, Give them a place to put their trash, besides on the other side of the dike. Are you seeing a lot of trash down in that area? You don't see a whole lot. It's just enough that I've got one neighbor across the street that walks in the morning and she puts everybody's newspapers on their doors, but she also turns around and picks up the trash down along the railroad tracks, but has no place to put it because the closest container is down by the stands by the pavilion, and she doesn't go up and over the dike. But yeah, there is trash. It accumulates because you have people. The trick is, is can we at least give them a receptacle, receptacle to put it, the, the trash into? Eric, would it be possible maybe one of those recycling type bins so that you don't have the wide open, all kinds of trash ends up in that? Yeah, I mean, we can do recycle. Huh. What about something like that? Well, and then in the, the park on Parkside, there's a smaller trash can with the green lid that says dog waste only on the top. And that's that may work better there because it's really only people walking who would use that mm -hmm. trash can. And at, at Brentwood Park, they might put things other than dog waste in there, but it is a nice small trash can for dog waste. And it's, I, was, I go almost every morning and it's all full of dog waste. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten the, the residents in the habit, good ownership is take care and pick up after your dog, but you gotta give them a place to put it. Yeah, the dog waste it's container and bags is a simple yeah. a simple fix, and that's... So that in a recycling mm -hmm. can? Uh, well, if you put the recycling out there, are you looking just for the recyclable materials? Then what do you do with 
the empty beer can or the cup or stuff when you have trash track. We're having the public works department put stickers on people's trash cans telling them if it's not right recyclables, they can't take it, fix it, and we'll take it next week. I'd hate to have a recycling bin down there that we turn a blind eye and yeah, we'll just empty it no matter what goes in it type thing. So I think you're sending a nice message, but it's not the complete message yeah, but Eric's of point getting is rid of the trash. The guys are having to go down there and pick up heavy materials that I and I that uh, just attract it because the can sit down. I, I do understand that issue. I do. But the dilemma is that by not having the trash cans down there, you haven't solved the trash problem. You've just forced it to go elsewhere or drop it where it lays. Give them the can. I think it's reasonable enough to do so. You and realize that most of the people that you're talking about are the park users. I have one or two bad apples that ruin it for everybody else. You're never going to prevent that, but at least make it so that you keep your parks in your area clean. That would be helpful. Are you going to make a motion? So moved. Okay, one more second. So, can we recreate what exactly the motion is to put two cans out? To put, get, at least get two new trash cans down along the, the parking spaces so that we can accommodate people throwing away waste or trash. Uh, the next update is on the RFQs for survey services uh, that RFQs out. Proposals are due on the 20th, and uh, we'll have recommendations back to the December Public Works Committee. And uh, any questions on that one? Do, <clears throat> just curious, do we send that out to the same people that replied to the last we RFP? Did. We did. So everybody to everyone, knows. And then it's on the city's website as well. Okay. Thanks. And then if you'll, I'm sorry, was there? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And then lastly, um, just this came out, uh, this came up yesterday, so I didn't have a chance to put it in a memo or anything. But I was contacted by the city of Clayton. Uh, if you know, uh, Shaw Park Ice Rink is going to be closed for the next years for renovation. And so they asked if we'd be interested in partnering with them to allow the Brentwood Ice Rink as a place for the residents to come. And so what they'd like to do is provide a discount for the residents and more importantly, be able to advertise that. Um, and be able to basically let them know that Brentwood Ice Rink is a place for them to go for the next two years. Not only during the winter time, obviously it's a seasonal place, but throughout the entire year. Uh, obviously it could be a win-win for them, for us, uh, and they're willing to pay us something for it. Um, so the question is, are we okay with um, talking to the city of Clayton about getting a partnership agreement with them for the next two years? Uh, what that dollar amount is yet, I don't know, because I want to make sure that we were okay with doing something like that. And that would come back to us when you determine that. It would. Uh, obviously, they're interested. They're, they're supposed to open after Thanksgiving, so we'd like to move on this fairly quickly, but we'd probably bring it back in the next Public Works Committee, uh, agreement pretty well hammered out so that we their residents could be coming forward pretty quickly. Andy? This is for the open session of ice time, or is this their hockey leagues coming No, over? They, they don't have any. I thought they had a Sunday morning hockey league that played outdoors. It, it, they do, that's, we're not talking about that. So just this is just the residents to come over in our free sessions. skating times yep. exactly. to work with, okay? They would be able to come now, they just wouldn't get the resident rate. Correct. And a lot of them are coming now, to be completely honest, but basically this is just what they want to do since their ice rinks down is basically provide a added amenity and, yeah. and show that they're doing something since their rinks down. It's good to be the city to the residents. So motion to do that. Okay. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Moving on to Public Works Department. Dan, you've got a few things for us. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you had time to look at all three of these and if you had any specific questions, but there's three different unique things that I wrote memos on. The first one was garden court, street light uh, inspection. We were sent a MyGov request. We took a look at it. Originally, there was a request saying that there was only one light, and reality is that there's actually three lights. So then the request came back that it was still dark, so we went out there and actually inspected and took the light measure, measurement device and actually recorded measurements. So 
I included photos in your memo. And the, uh, the short version here is that of the ones we tested, you know, at those addresses, we had a 6.66 lux, a 10.05, a 7.15. What it actually means is that those measurements are actually within design standards. So for that particular pavement, which is asphalt, for that particular number of pedestrians, which would be low because, you know, it's a dead end street, it should be in the range of four to six units, you know, four to six lux units. And all three of them are. And I know if you look at the pictures, you can see that the street is lit from side to side and pretty much from the cul-de-sac all the way out to mobile on the run. Um, so, you know, again, we looked at it, we investigated, gathered the facts, and it looks like it's actually fine. You're not going to be able to, you know, read a book or something out there at night, but it does fall within standards, you know, for streets. So I don't know if you wanted to do any more with it. The only thing I thought was as these lights die off, these are high pressure sodium, we would ask Ameren to replace them with LEDs because these are actually Ameren owned. I just didn't want to ask Ameren to replace something that falls within standard and they work. Because it would be at our cost. It would be at our cost, right. When they fail, then we can have them upgrade them because I did send them. And that's um, at no cost, right? Right. Yeah, they were sent a request. There's one at the corner of McKnight and Sonora and whenever I measured it, it was 0.55. And because it's on McKnight, it should be somewhere in like the 15 range. You know, the one just to the south of it is 17 lux. It's like, well, 0.55. It would never fully start when I was standing there. It would flicker and then die and then flicker and die and there's something wrong with it. I looked at it today. They still haven't replaced it because I could see it's still the old fixture. Brandon, did you have anything? No, just motion to do nothing. Well, <laughs> I, <laughs> I would tend to agree. I think it's one of our better lit streets. It really is. I walked at it. I think it might be one nice. of the better motions we've had. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Dan, for the information. Yeah, yeah, thanks for doing that. You got a complaint from just one resident? It was a, a MyGov ticket, so I'm assuming it, it was just one. It was just one. I submitted it on behalf of the resident. Okay, right. Yeah. Would it, could I suggest that we send her or them at least the, re, the report that you presented yeah. to us? Just so they know, A, we did something, and B, they understand what's there and why it's just not being changed. I think that would be a kind courtesy. Okay. That's easy to do. She was present at the board meeting. Yes. yes. Okay. But, and I think she at least deserves sure. the response. Sure. And the report was marvelous. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was very Thanks. Good. Yeah, we'll uh, print off a report and just drop it off. And if she's got any questions, I'll just leave a card and she can call. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sorry. Uh, switching gears, the customer service improvements at City Hall. I know some of you have gone to City Hall uh, to take a look at the renovations as they're progressing. Jay Foster's been there. This is their third month, yeah, because they started September. Um, all the demolition work's done. They've done a lot of the framing. A lot of the wire pulls have been done as well. Uh, we have had changes. If you recall, the original contract amount was 725000 And if you look at the changes, I tried to break them out. What the change is, a description. There is one actual deduct, and that's for a light fixture, and we're getting another deduct. There's some floor boxes that don't need to be done. But at the time that I wrote this, these were the ones that we had in our possession. So total changes is roughly 47,371, and with our contingency, we were saying 775, so we're still under that cap. Um, as far as their completion date, they're still targeting January to have everything done and do the punch list. It's a couple weeks off. Originally it was early, now it's like third week. Um, that was due to some light fixture uh, shipment dates. And all, again, all the abatement's been done. You know, One of the change orders, which no one thought of, the uh, bathrooms did not have floor drains. So if a toilet overflows, a sink overflows, it would just spill out into the hallway. So these improvements actually have a floor drain so it won't get the ceiling wet of the library, but the library ceiling need to be abated because of lead and asbestos to make room for the drain. Yeah. So these, they're unforeseen conditions. I mean, it's, it's an older building, so you don't expect these things, but they happen on every project. And I just kind of threw in some photos to show you, you know, one of the more significant change orders was the tile. At the time of the bid, the tile existed, it was a ceramic tile. Whenever we went to go purchase it after the submittal was in, there's not enough square area, so the closest color match is a natural stone, and natural stone requires wet sawing, which is more labor and 
more material because there's going to be breakage because it's natural. It's not man-made. And then, you know, the ADA ramp. And I always thought it was kind of cool. There's the uh, staircase that goes to nowhere. The hidden? When you, yeah, the hidden staircase. When you first walk in, it was to your left, and it went down to the basement. And it, it was covered on both ends. So. But that'll just remain in place. They'll just cover it. They'll cover it back up. Correct. Yeah, because they found it when they have to frame a new doorway. So the new door will have um, an ADA operator on the outside. Uh, if you've driven by, they took the plastic up so you can see the ramps. You know, so there's ADA switchbacks. We still have to create the uh, handrail system for the new ADA ramps. Okay. Should put a time capsule in there or something for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> we could, yeah, but in the staircase. You <laughs> haven't discovered what we already knew existed. We just chose yeah. not to use it. Yeah. <laughs> So what we'll do is uh, we can just keep this going. Like as we get closer, we'll just do monthly updates and show you, you know, where we are cost-wise, schedule-wise. Um, you know, and if anybody does want to take a tour, we're still open for business. And we're still on uh, the, the time frame, even with some of these divisions. Right. That's the good part. I mean, like I said, we're just a couple weeks off from what they submitted when we first sat down and did the pre-construction. Uh, so. Any other questions for Dan? All right, okay. Dan. Yorkshire Lane. Uh, the last one, this, I don't know if you recall, some of you probably do, uh, this request probably a couple years ago, but it came up again. Uh, there was an access path long time ago, so I went, did a little bit of research. Uh, the first photo that you see in that memo, you can see the parking lot to what used to be Fraser Elementary and when Brentwood School District was back there, and there was a pathway that went across an empty lot. Well, since the time of this photo, which was April of 2010, the house was built in 2014, which is number six, Yorkshire Lane Court. That number six, Yorkshire Lane Court, actually covers over the top of that sidewalk, and there is no sidewalk there now. What people are actually doing is they're walking from Swan Circle up that person's private property between their fences and into the cul-de-sac of Yorkshire Lane Court, and then walking back to a assume, you know, going west, you know, to either York Village or I know there's other pathways in there. Um, I know that they've been approached to see if they would be interested in allowing an easement across there and they were not, you know, in this shortcut area that people are now using. And there are little signs posted that say private property, both like on a little yard sign and then on the fence. Best I can tell from the county map, I'm still going to pull the uh, plat when it was platted, but Based on the county map, that's all private property they have. I think it was like 0.39 acre or something to that effect. It's kind of an unusual shape because it warps around the arc of the cul-de-sac. But it appears that that retaining wall system and fence is on their property, and it's becoming, you know, deteriorated. I don't know when it was put in. If the house is in 2014, there's no way the tie wall and fence was. That's and it also appeared in the 2010 photo, and it appeared before that. So I didn't go far enough back to see if maybe it disappeared and try to narrow down the timeline when the wall was built. But I know the first few homes in uh, off of uh, Yorkshire were put in in 1996. So it could have dated around there, you know, mid to late 90s, which would explain its condition if it's 20-something years old. So this was more for information, too, uh, just to explain, you know, we've looked into it. It doesn't seem feasible, but what we did think would be feasible, I don't know if other people know that this even exists, but near high school in Swan Circle, there is a trail. It's a mulch trail, though. It's not concrete like what used to be the Fraser, but it goes east to west and it connects up with the dead end of St. Clair. So there is a way to go from, say, Brentwood Forest, you know, kind of west without going along the <coughs> sidewalk of West Swan Circle. But. Just the, I'm one of those people who walks through there. <laughs> I should admit that, <laughs> but <laughs> it's a really neat. My I walk, kids walk through there. The kids who live in the Ward One area mm -hmm. walk down to go to the bread company or to go sledding in the winter. Uh, I think the Ward Four people walk through there to try to get over to Tillis Park because there's no park on the west side of right. Brentwood Boulevard. So there's a lot of need for that and even this path that ex the the mulch path it's i mean you may as well go down lawn the way it mm -hmm. is i mean if, if it could cut 
for, you know, there's a lot of green space there and if it could cut through, but I don't, I mean, I, I don't, the city doesn't own that. I think that's, is that Brentwood Forest? And I assumed it was Brentwood Forest. I assume it's yeah. Brentwood Forest and then it's not, you, you know, you have to enter that path unless you're walking through grass on High School Drive, so it's. Yeah, because it did go up St. Clair and you know there's a green like guardrail at the dead end mm -hmm. and then that path intersects the sidewalk that terminates at the dead end yeah. of St. Clair on the east side. I've lived here 22 years, I never knew you could do that. So, and I've walked and run and everything and I never knew you could do that until you sent this email. Yeah, Eric's the one that suggested to me that there was a trailer. I saw the mulch whenever we were doing work near the yep. intersection, but I didn't know. I saw people walking a dog and I just assumed that it was someone's property. But the only way we'd be able to build these steps, or I guess it would have to be an ADA accessible ramp. Right, you'd have to do like a switchback so that you could meet those two elevations yeah, and bring people up gradually. Privately owned piece of land. But right. Yeah, you couldn't just start building it. It's not ours. The other problem is that there's utilities there. I mean, there's a utility pole and you can see an underground electric feeder. And there's definitely an MSD manhole. So there's a pipe somewhere. And the individual that owns that property has no intention on Right, they, yeah, if it changes ownership, maybe then it's a different scenario, but right now there's no chance. It, it doesn't sound very feasible, but I would say it's definitely, it would be a welcome addition to mm -hmm. these two neighborhoods to be able to easily walk and traverse that. All right, anything else? So no action? No action. Um, <laughs> Is, is there a specific no. feedback we take to? Because Alderwoman O'Neill asked us to, to bring this to the committee. The only um, thing I could see would be if he is forced to replace that wall because of the condition it's mm -hmm. in, that in order for him to save the cost of having to do all that work, he donates that land to the city so we can build something. I think you've taken a reasonable course by having at least broached the topic with him about potentially putting it in. I think the homeowners made it clear it's his private property, and I think the city should respect that to work with. And yes, as Dan points out, if you have a change of ownership, you can always broach the topic again, but I don't think it should be the city that steps in and says, no, we're going to do this oh, no, type no, thing. No. And since We've had the, the polite conversation. That's as far as you take it. Have we had the conversation about the fence falling, like the fence is in bad repair? We have not. Yeah, I was going to turn the photos over to planning. We would be turning it over to planning, but then we, we run the risk of him now saying, because of the situation, we're now going this route to make it from a different point. tell you from what I've been able to do, the retaining wall does have bad ties in it, mm -hmm. but that doesn't require you to rip everything out. You can replace those bad, the bad ones and put them back in. We did it not only on other retaining walls, but we did it as an Eagle project over at uh, McGrath School one year for their entire toy, uh, toy area. It can be done. It's not, it's not inexpensive, but it's not impossible. He doesn't have to rip out the whole thing. Dancing problem soon on the east yep, side. Thank you for looking at yeah. All right, planning and development department. Lisa. Do we have a guest from? Yeah, we have two home? items tonight for some discussion. Um, but I want to introduce Christy Wilson with Horner and Schifrin. Um, if you recall, the board hired Horner and Schifrin, I think it was back in August. We kicked this project off in September 
to really review stormwater management and in for particular for infill development for residential housing. So um, we've, I know they've researched a lot of other communities and they've also definitely have taken in Brentwood circumstances when they look at other ordinances that might work. We, we've said this before, we have a lot of density here, we have small lots to work with, we're trying to build big homes on small lots. So again, we wanted to make sure that whatever they came up with was taking all of that into consideration. So um, we also did some site visits so that they could be more, uh, have more knowledge about what we're kind of facing more on a daily basis with construction. So with that being said, um, Christy's here to present their findings to this point and uh, even some recommendations and um, trying to get a little bit of a direction from the committee this evening. So, Christy? Hello, oh, good evening. Um, as Lisa said, we took a look at um, not only the ordinances within Brentwood and the surrounding areas, but then also conducted a site visit with Steve's assistance and kind of to gain a better understanding of some of the issues that have been, that have come up within the city and um, unfortunately or fortunately for you, you're not alone. <laughs> Everybody is experiencing kind of the same thing as, as desires in the communities change for changing housing, changing in car size, multiple cars that we just didn't have 50, 60 years ago when a lot of the homes were built. So um, things are changing. Um, as Lisa said, we, we did do a comparison on different lot sizes in different communities. Um, the average residential lot size, so we did exclude all commercial lots, is about two tenths of an acre. So it's not tiny. I mean, I know a lot of newer developments have smaller lots than that. So it's not unreasonably small, but when you're seeing the different types of things that you have in the limited green space that, that the stormwater is becoming a bigger issue. So we looked at a lot of those things. Um, the communities in and around Brentwood, it's kind of uh, all or nothing. Uh, a lot of the communities either have a comprehensive stormwater or they rely on MSD's requirements. And MSD's requirements are primarily for one acre uh, developments and larger. So that falls typically to uh, commercial developments. I mean, some residential, but primarily it, it falls more on the commercial and to, to controlling runoff and, and doing some different things. So that's kind of what we saw in our research is that the communities either have a program or they don't. So um, <clears throat> right now there's a couple of different items. I know the codifying the 10 feet from the property line for any sump pump or uh, downspout discharge is, is one of the recommends that recommendations that we've made. Your staff is currently kind of following that as a guidance, but to put that actually in the city code um, would give them kind of a leg to stand on if, if there are problems that occur. Um, in developing a comprehensive stormwater management program, um, that's going to increase the requirements for building permits and what, what you're requiring from the engineers and the architects and the designers of those, those improvements. Um, they, right now, you require uh, topographic information, contours, so that you can look at where the drainage is, is going and that you're not changing it from its current pathway, but there are no detailed calculations uh, that take into consideration impervious area with respect to the lot size and how much runoff is actually being generated on that site. Um, now, taking into consideration one lot is only a piece of a drainage area, but if every property in that drainage area increases, then it's just, it's a magnifying thing. So, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. That that's kind of the the biggest issue. There is it is only one one property is only one piece of the puzzle. But as everyone begins to improve their buildings and improve their properties, 
then you, you run into those problems. So the other thing, one of the other things that we re recommended was having those calculations provided at when a building permit is obtained, having the engineer or designer calculate not only what is there existing, and then also with the proposed improvements, how that changes. So those, and then um, with any increase in runoff that's generated, they take steps to store that and control it and release it slowly back to the surface. So um, in order to do that though, would require obviously changes to the city code, but then also review having somebody that understands the stormwater requirements review those. Because you're on small lots, every lot is different, so you can't make a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, given that there's older lots, we're not talking city lots here, so you don't have the stacked stone foundations, but if you're putting in something that is gonna store water right next to a foundation, you don't wanna raise the water table so that you're causing another problem by fixing one. So you really, it's gonna require some uh, different solutions, some creative solutions to make sure that you control the runoff, but that also you're not creating a problem for any of the, the residents as well. So, um, Given that there's gonna be additional review requirements, uh, you would wanna institute a review fee that would cover any costs that you would incur by having that review take place. So those are, those are the, the main recommendations that we've come through. Uh, different communities have done uh, a different levels of control. A lot of that has depends on the size of the lots. Is more, Places more likely to do have bigger lots. They have one design storm. They control to the 1.14 inch, which is also what MSD is controlling for water quality. So on the on the large lot size, they do the 1.14 inches of rainfall for water quality. Um, others are using the actual uh, design storm for the design of stormwater pipes and sewers and drainage systems of the 15 year, 20 minute storm. So those are the two, two big extremes that we've seen within the, the different uh, stormwater management plans that have been developed. Okay, a couple of questions. Yes. In your presentation, you stated that the city of Brentwood does require topographical maps on the, the building sites. I'm not aware that that's the case. Um, I believe it is on the um, you the architectural review uh, permit requires contours, but that's really um, just to show you where the drainage is flowing off of the site away from the buildings. It is not a comprehensive stormwater yeah. calculation. Second arrangement you mentioned passing an ordinance to try to keep the discharge of water at least 10 feet from the edge of the properties. I've got class grade B home arrangements where the setbacks are five feet. I mean, I've got them on my house where my gutters come down and they dump right there on the short side because I'm only five feet off the property line. So I, I'm kind of going, how do I pass an ordinance that says it has to be 10 feet away when I tell you you can build the property within five feet of the line? makes it rather Extremely. tough to, to accomplish. Yes, um, if you can make it so it's di directed towards uh, the longer side of the parcel, so it might not be 10 feet on all sides, but that, yeah. um, and, and you can make modifications to that. I, that's a guidance that I know your staff is working okay. with. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Just, so you, you mentioned that uh, Kirkwood requires a dry well or a vegetated filter strip. Just yeah. out of curiosity, how big is a vegetated filter strip that can handle 175 square feet of contributing area? Is that like? Um, I have not done, approximately. I haven't done the calculations on that to know what it is. It all depends on the type of soil that's there too. Yeah. I mean, mostly everything around here is clay. So <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't accept a lot of water, 
But um, I haven't done the calculations on as I mean, far as the actual 20, size. I, just you know, notionally, is it like 20 foot by 20 foot of vegetation that's required to, to handle that? Or I'm just trying to think what this would look like on our small yards. Four by 30. They're just, I, um, I really don't know. Okay. They're just, what they're trying to do is make it so that you give the water a chance to absorb into the Perfectly. ground. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Look it up. Okay. Well, there's some recommendations that were made, um, and I think Kevin's chimed in on a, a few of these with questions. Have those been answered yet? Or? Um, no, we are still waiting for something formal. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, we staff had a chance to review uh, Horner and Schifrin's work, and so then with our responses, that was what was forwarded to Kevin just last week, so we haven't gotten that back yet. Um, so I think, again, there's a lot of great information here. I think the overall decision has to be if Brentwood, you know, wants to go big or go home kind of thing. So, I mean, are we going to go ahead and make our requirement be like zero, you know, new runoff? Um, or, again, are we going to still have some kind of hybrid of what we have right now, which says we're going to still let things kind of go the natural drainage way but not create nuisances or problems for people? But as you can see, that's been difficult, you know, for us to really just go ahead and, and try to use that. So um, my, my concern still would be, though, of like running through drainage calculations. And then, of course, as Christy said, we'd have to have an outside service probably review that information. But assuming we get drainage calculations, they're sealed by an engineer. Um, they are reviewed then. And um, I also kind of wonder, though, so that's good for now, as soon as it's constructed on that date. But there are a lot of activities that people can start making changes to their backyards, especially, that do not require any permits from the city. So I think over time, you know, there's going to be uh, potential maybe for these best practices now not to work if someone starts to add a garden or, you know, put in a new patio or things like that. So it's almost like not only do we have to decide if we want these new requirements, but then I think we have to give a lot of thought and consideration to how we're going to keep the maintenance of these in the future and how we're going to be able to kind of track them. So again, other communities have found solutions, so I'm not trying to um, say that this would not work. But you know, I think, again, we, we still have a little bit of a different situation because even with the comparable communities, we are still one of the communities amongst that group that have very small lots to work with. And I guess, um, you know, one of the requirements about putting in the 10-foot rule back from the property line, we've now run into questions where we've been pulling the drainage out to the street. And the idea is that the curb and gutter is supposed to collect it. But, you know, would that apply? I mean, if we can't take water to the street anymore, and then also the water has to be 10 feet from the other property lines, I don't know if we have drainage solutions for some of these Those, lots yeah. if we go zero, zero increase in runoff. I, I don't know, I don't wanna. Well, like I said before, you're gonna have some creative solutions, but in, you're not gonna be able to solve all, ish, all, all situations for all rain events. And I guess that's the one thing, if you do institute a program, one of the things is some education to the residents. Just because you require as as Kirkwoods has that uh, vegetated strip or the dry well. When you get big rain events, they don't solve it. It's not. It's not going to do it. This is for your average rainfalls. These are not for the big downpours that last all day in the spring when the ground is already saturated because it rained every day three days prior to that. So it's not going to eliminate all runoff. It is to help control the runoff and mitigate nuisance problems is really and and so there will be some additional education just for residents to understand that even though these things may be required it's not going to keep water from drain following the natural drainage path mm -hmm. and draining from one property to the next water will still follow the same path that it always has but as we pave more areas and we're creating that, we're, we're eliminating the areas for the water to go back into the ground. So Thanks. we're reducing those. Well, it sounds like we still have some work to do, but I would definitely uh, 
look forward to us continuing to work on this. I think the biggest issue I've heard is water runoff. I don't want us to get into a situation where we could have done some thoughtful ordinances to help prevent this and we get into a situation where water's running off and neighbors are suing neighbors because the water's running. Uh, we, you know, we, we're not that kind of community and I think we should be able to do some thoughtful um, uh, change uh, on uh, new construction and these larger things. We had another meeting yesterday um, and we had some homework to do. Do you want to talk about that in just generalities? Um, I'm not sure what you want me to touch upon. It was also about some of the, I guess, existing conditions existing of lots. Conditions. Okay. So again, we've been talking about primarily what to do with stormwater management for infill housing. So a lot of situations that we have, though, out there are definitely nuisances. I mean, without probably question. And uh, but again, they're on older lots, and they may the improvements may have followed whatever our code required back at that time. That's probably what the situation is going to be. But now they're still creating a nuisance. One of the main problems I would say would be collection of the water either on the sidewalks or pouring out into the street. And of course, now we're going to hear about it more because of the deep freeze that we had. And so we have situations where things have iced over. And it, and it is very, very um, you know, serious. So I guess part of our conversation yesterday was although their scope includes what we're going to maybe come up with requirements for infill housing, we have work to do also with still trying to address existing conditions that we have. And um, so I know we've, we've talked with Kevin. Kevin, our city attorney, has actually drafted an agreement where, um, I'll just keep it very general in nature, basically it says that if the problem can't be fixed or the owner chooses not to fix whatever the nuisance is, let's say again, right now the situation is where all of his gutter downspouts and sump pump is discharged into a pipe that's out into the street. So if that doesn't get fixed by the homeowner, then another option might be to allow him to sign this agreement um, with the city, but it still holds him then responsible for the situation, for any injury. It would also indemnify the city from any of that liability. Um, but again, I'm not sure if that really fixes the problem, so. Just makes everybody aware of it. Nancy. Yeah. Nancy. So I have heard from, like I had a new one today, the ice situation I wasn't aware of. There's a really bad ice situation down for me. There's all, they're all over Brentwood, so I'm glad that you're looking at how to fix this. And then my question is, when somebody puts in a sump pump, like on an existing home, do you need a permit for that? Um, I might defer to Steve for that. So there is some. Um, yeah, if it's not hooked to the potable water system, the plumbing permit would be required. Um, and it doesn't discharge into the sanitary sewer, so uh, that would be another thing you look at the gauge of plumbing permit. So I, I would say probably not unless they have, you know, if they have to run a, an electrical system over there, or the electrical permit would be required. Well, because that seems to more, even houses that are newer in filler doing more and more people are putting in sumps, which then puts more water out, maybe further than 10 feet from the, their property line. So. Sure. So I think next step would be is we regroup with Horner and Schifrin. Um Kevin, I'm sure we'll get back with this in the next few days. It would probably be good to have him at the next meeting that we have with Horner and Schifrin. They record some notes from the meetings that we have, so there'll be like a summary generated from our discussion but keep working really towards what we think would be viable recommendations to make to the committee at an upcoming meeting, I don't know, a month or two. Um, and then if there were changes to the ordinances that we would proceed with, that is still part of Horner and Schifrin's scope of work for this particular contract. But if there's other things with the recommendations, like getting into more um, other best practices and coming up with other stormwater collection methods or putting together a manual, those are all things beyond that scope. But again, we'll, we'll just address that as, as we get there. But I just wanted to kind of let you know we're pretty much closing out a little bit what, what we're here to do with Horner and Schifrin under this contract, so. And definitely Kevin, our city attorney, will be there. He can't come to this meeting because he has another standing meeting. Well, 
don't know them and another yeah. client. Yeah. But we are talking with them, and maybe ultimately there might be another attorney from his firm that can come. But he's given us a lot of good ideas from the meeting. Actually, the meeting yesterday was with Lisa, Eric, Dan, and the mayor, um, and Kevin. So um, some of our takeaways were maybe explore a letter to the different homeowners, make them aware of the condition that exists on their property and the corresponding liability. So we've put them on notice. Um, and part of that notice is we give them a certain period of time to rectify that problem. Um, and also tell them though that, um, so one of the recommendations would be to disconnect the pipe that discharges water to the street and the city would take that on and disconnect those pipes. So we're just exploring that and looking at maybe drafting that letter. So before that letter goes out, we will notify you so that when you start to get the calls, you know, because ultimately what did you all the, do? the correction is going to be costly yeah. Yeah. To, to people, mm -hmm. and one will have to budget for something like that. Yeah. Well, my concern is on the new home builds, if we all of a sudden put ourselves out there as experts, do we somehow get dragged in on a legal basis? Yeah. I think that's a question in there. Right, some of so these. that's what we're waiting on some feedback. Because right. I, I don't want to put words into Kevin's mouth. That's not my place to do so. Right. But you've heard him, I think it was the June Public Works Committee meeting, what he said about some of the drainage issues. That is the other take on it, so. Okay. Question if I may. When we currently do a review of a building for construction or in, do we even consider where the downspouts and all that are in the plans? Do we have a checklist that says, yeah, we looked at them and this will or will not work, or could you redirect it because you're gonna push it into this? Is there anything though like that? Because I know we don't have an ordinance that says no, but in looking at the plans, do we make suggestions to the guys that says, maybe you redirect here would be would be helpful? Yeah, um, again, it's an informal. We, well, and you know, we always hate to get into that situation though, where because we start to giving on, advice, gotcha. you know, and so we sound like we're so not helpful, but what we try to imply is that we're not designers and you know, we're not engineers because as soon as we kind of say, well, this would be better to take this over there or whatever, we kind of start opening up, you know, that door. So, but in terms of the process, I mean, if you wanted maybe Steve just to go through very briefly, well, when I did my re re reworking and stuff, mm -hmm. I did take the south side drains and I redirected them to go east and west and then piped them out further and perforated it so that I knew I could get drainage instead of sticking everything right at my neighbor's house mm -hmm. type thing. Yeah, there was nothing that told me I had to do it, but as long as I was doing the work, that was the time to put it in the plan. Well, and I think what we're gonna find out, this is a general, just a very general statement, but even my, I'm not an engineer mm -hmm. either, so I still think about um, largely how do things flow from your gutter and downspouts and that obviously I know water runs downhill and we talk about gravity and that you want to be able to have your discharge point at a place where it still comes out on your property and there's enough time for it to filter and, and again, but I think what we're going to find out is we're not going to be able to have that very traditional way of discharging. I think it comes down to the dry wells and all of the other things that we talk about, um, other methods I think are gonna have to become a part of this because I don't know that a lot of these five, 6,000 square foot lots are gonna be able to have mm -hmm. this one, you know, and that's how I think of drainage. It's very rudimentary because I'm not an engineer, but I think we're gonna find out we're gonna have to be much more creative in these backyards. Well, I, I just encourage us to be creative as people are building their homes so that we're not, we're doing less of the mailing these threatening letters later, like you're a nuisance. If we can help them design, like, oh, you need a dry well, and that would help solve the runoff issues, so. Good, thanks, Lisa. Christy, thank you very much for making this easily understood <laughs> for a guy like me. You know, Great report. <laughs> All right, item number eight, we postpone the consent agenda to next meeting. We'll move on to old business. I guess, Lisa, this is you again, residential building and construction permits. So 
At the October meeting, we had more residents here that uh, got up and spoke during the public comment period. There's a lot of good information, I think, that was, was put before this committee in, in front of staff. And um, I think largely it falls into, though, two categories. One is what can we do in terms of speeding up construction on single family residential projects. And the overall one that I heard also was just in general, we gotta, we gotta do better with these job construction sites. You know, the, the in, especially if the project is gonna labor over months or years, we need to try to minimize as much inconvenience as we can to the neighbors. So um, with that, I guess starting out with the length of construction, I kinda did wanna just start out with some quick little facts here. So since 2016, which is totally arbitrary why I picked 2016, it's about the time I started work here in Brentwood, but we've had 28 new single family residential projects since that time. And staff has granted out of those 28, um, we have been requested and we approved five extensions to those building permits. Uh, and actually those went to three different builders. And of these five extensions that were granted for these 28 projects, two of them actually then also folded into just um, uh, revoking the building permit and requiring them to get a new building permit. So I just wanted to get, give you a sense of what kind of the numbers are and how either this problem is, if it's you know significant. Um, so the significant majority of the projects, these 28, projects that we had, then almost all of them fell like right at about a year to get done. There was this cluster of, of homes though that the least amount kind of averaged more around the eight or nine month period. But I would have to say from what our records show that it's at least probably gonna take eight months to build a custom home here in Brentwood. Um, and we don't have to go into the reasons why that is or whatever at this point. But, um, so I just wanted to go ahead and just give you some numbers to kind of work with. But to start out, then the city requirement for a building permit is that it is valid for 12 months. And this is under section 400.1150. So I want to point out that the code though goes on to state, and this is a quote, um, application for renewal must be made by the application upon expiration unless substantial construction has been initiated and is being pursued diligently towards completion. So the reason why I wanted to bring that to your attention is it's not an automatic, but just because you go beyond 12 months that the builder has to request an extension. And um, that gives us a lot of latitude, which I don't know if that's a good thing or not, which is one thing we may want to consider changing. Um, so again, we have a lot of latitude as to whether to even require a renewal of the original building permit. So how do we make that determination? So again, we might be, um, people might agree or disagree to what kind of parameters we set, but the things that we look for is if we're gonna even push them to getting, um, requesting an extension is where are we at with inspections? Are we still being called out to inspect those homes? Do we see contractors there? Um, I understand that work is, is slow and there might be days, even weeks, where there aren't maybe even contractors on that particular job, but those are still the parameters that we kind of set to decide if we are gonna request that they need to um, renew their, their building permit. So as I said, totally open about this, but you know, do consideration, do we wanna remove giving staff this latitude and maybe automatically requiring the builder to request an extension after 12 months? And then again, it may or may not be granted by staff. It still should be on whatever justifiable cause that they give us that they needed the extension. And so um, after that alternative though, our only then recourse is to totally revoke a building permit. So if we limit again the extension and how long do we limit it to? Do we only wanna grant an extension that's three months? That's what some of the communities have. Some are six months. If we follow just with the IRC, which is the code that we follow, the International Residential Code, it actually gives us the latitude then to grant as many extensions as we need and for periods of 180 days for each extension. So that's what we're operating under right now. So that might be something that we want to consider. 
And uh, let's see. So I guess before I leave that point, what I would like to say is there is different ways to go ahead and um, try to get that builder to complete that project quicker. But the way I kind of also look at it, the more times we go ahead and either have the builder stop and ask for the extension, or we go ahead and stop the work because we revoked the building permit, and now you have to apply for a new building permit, that's also just time that gets taken away from being able to get the job done. I don't think it hurts anything if it's a builder who just bought this lot, is building a house, and it's for speculative purposes, but most of the situations that we run into, you've already got a buyer for these homes. So in essence, is it really hurting the builder by putting more of these requests for extensions and, and revoking permits? Does it ultimately just kind of hurt the home buyer and the residents? So, and, and what we've been operating under right now, because we do have a lot of, a lot of latitude to make that decision, is, um, you know, we just, of anything, we want to keep the project moving. That is really our, our number one goal. If, if everybody would just still be um, getting new building permits, but that project stalls, what good does it also do to have then a house sitting there that a builder couldn't finish, and then you have no one working on it for the next two years because nobody then wants to pick up the house and get into whatever they need to do to try to encumber the title to the property or what have you. So I am really willing to kind of look at some options, but I, I did wanted to at least make you aware of how much of the problem we think we see out there, and secondly, kind of some of the complications or consequences from looking at these various options. So um, <clears throat> there was also one other ordinance that we looked at that had like a companion piece to also looking at numbering the extensions or the length of those extensions. And one um, code we looked at talked about requiring a deposit for that builder to go ahead and complete the project. And we actually do require deposits for certain activities. So when we issue demolition permits, that is a case before that demolition permit is issued, we do require a deposit. Um, we do that also for work or construction activity that is on a right of way. And <clears throat> a third time, or a third situation where we go ahead and require a deposit is when we issue temporary occupancies, but that doesn't occur very often. But in those cases where we do that now, that is truly a deposit because what we are collecting that money for, which also goes into an escrow account, it doesn't get commingled in with the general revenue fund or anything like that. And it is a deposit because the only reason we hold on to it is until that project is done, we finaled it out, and there's no work that we would have to go in and do ourselves. So if that's the case, then that deposit is returned. The, uh, the only examples that we saw, and maybe there's others out there, but from the communities that had something like this for this deposit for completion, it was set up so that, um, again, if, it, if the, we're, we're asking for an action from that builder, and if that builder didn't get that house done on, on such and such day, then we just, we just keep that deposit. Now, <clears throat> I think that is gonna be a huge legal question, which we've already, <laughs> asked Kevin to weigh in on. So the legality of that, I, I would really question if, if a community could do that. So that would be one of the concerns that I had about the completion deposits. Also, I think if we, you know, I know that in some, the reason why it was brought up was well, that could really deter a builder then if they knew that they had to leave this money on the table, then that will make sure that he gets this project delivered on time. And so that does sound good, but I, I had actually talked to one community that has had this for several years, and I asked her, I go, well, what was the largest amount that you ever had then for this substantial um, deposit? And the number was $11,000. And $11,000, I think, is a chunk of change, so that might you know, really be a deterrent for that builder if he's just gotta eat that or forfeit that money for not delivering on time. But then I step back and say, but that house is still not finished. And so what I can see happening is whenever that job starts up again, does that $11,000 somehow get rolled into the project and then directly or indirectly gets passed back on to the homeowner and the resident again. So 
I don't know. I, I'm just trying to look at these at various angles. Um, so I, I would be interested in though maybe looking at, at um, cutting down the staff's latitude on uh, both extensions and revocations. And I also wanted to explore a little bit more what I've noticed in ordinances is um, requiring builders to do a certificate of insurance for workman's comp, general liability, and I forgot what the third area of insurance was. We actually asked for that as part of our contractor's registration program, but I'll be the first one to say that we're lax on it. Um, a lot of them just submit that document when they apply, but we haven't verified that everyone has turned that in. What good that might do is if, again, um, contractors can't even produce kind of those limited insurance responsibilities, then maybe that would cut down on some of the builders that we have or contractors that maybe are not treating our residents the best. That might be another way to approach it as well. Where I'm at with this is I'm still just kind of gathering some other codes to look at. I've been talking to my peers. Um, and then again, I think also this has to be vetted with the city attorney. We've had discussions, but I think he's gonna be writing up kind of some of his um, opinions on some of these things. So it's kind of where I'm at right now, but I can take any questions or. We hear from the residents, because they have to put up with the inconvenience of the construction going in and out of the neighborhood till the thing's done. Have we heard from homeowners and stuff that, hey, I've got this guy and he's building my house and it's just not going right. You guys need to come in and, and help move him along because I can't seem to get his attention. Have we had those type of complaints? No, I've not had one. Do we have different contractors that we know their problem child, no matter what, no matter what, he'll meet my requirements, yes, he gets a permit, but I know I'm gonna have trouble every time I go out and do an inspection. I don't know, again, that's kind of subjective, I would say. Um, our, our builders all end up meeting our requirements that we have in terms of Otherwise contractors registration, contractors in good standing. There are other codes that have like all these prohibited acts that if you find, then you, you, know, you could go ahead and revoke the contractor's license. When I read some of those, there, there's just certain prohibited acts that I would never want to, you know, to try to weigh in on because um, it's misrepresentation of this or that. So, um, if I get a contractor who's got the permit and he's at the 12th month and he has not finished, now obviously he's got substantial money invested in the property because the house has got a shape and a frame and a foundation for it, but all the interior isn't done. Mm -hmm. I revoke or not extend his permit, what happens? We haven't done that yet. No, I mean, that would that would not be something I would even really wanna do because I don't know how so, that solves anything. And you're saying that in the code, it's kind of open for interpretation. Yeah, he may need to apply for a permit extension, but because he's got the substantial work, he can finish type thing, and thus he doesn't need the extension. Right, because um, the validity of our first original building permits 12 months is actually a city requirement. Okay. But then in terms of extensions, um, then we turn to the IRC, which we adopted. So that's where we get our direction on how to grant extensions. And as I said, that's very liberal. What okay. it says in there is we can grant as many extensions really and all for a period up to 180 days up to so that means again that we could either um, not give out six month extensions at a time or we go back and we accept that out of the IRC and we put something in our city requirements that we find that's working better okay. for us okay thank you anybody else yeah oh, Brandon. Go ahead, oh, Nancy. Sorry, Nancy. Um, so one of the things I read in all the materials you sent was about uh, you have to start within six months when you get the permit. Is that an issue? Do people get a permit and then sit on it or do they start and then it sits? Like what's so the time? So that again you'll find in the IRC. So if you're familiar with the municipal code, you're not gonna see that in there, but it's in the IRC. And um, my tenure here, that's never happened where we've had to revoke that someone hasn't gotten started. Started, okay. And so then what about, so there are six, 
unfinished homes right now that are over a year and then in the next few weeks there'll be two more so um, how how close are they to getting done yeah. or I mean because because yeah. we're bordering on a thing that I mean you don't you need to be we need to be strict enough so that the contractors can fi will finish and we won't inconvenience the neighbors but not so strict that you have all these that these will never be done because it's too onerous to Um, Meet our requirements. You know, again, I'm. I, I would be fine with looking at something that says we can only give one extension, and maybe for X amount of months or whatever, and then, and make them go through still, um, getting a new building permit because what can be a little bit of a deterrent in the cases that we had is when, as part of getting that new building permit, then they have to pay a new building permit, permit. fee based yeah. on whatever construction costs are still left to do. Um, and that again is fair. That's fair game. I don't think with legal stuff you have to question that. So at least that's some way. But you know, again, does that get passed on? I don't know. Um, it, it's not going to be. I can tell you this. That would not be something that should then all of a sudden, like the builder could tell his homeowner, "Gosh, I was doing great until the city came and revoked my permit, and then now it's taken me two months to get a new building permit." That's not happening. Um, and so that would not be, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that turnaround is fast. So that's also not much, um, I mean, I, Steve's the one who does our reviews, but I think he would probably agree that revoking and issuing a building permit would not take a lot of time, so. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I, I mean, this is a tough problem, right? I mean, I, I agree that you know, requiring a down posit is just going to get passed on to the homeowner, and there will, I don't think it's going to compel anybody to finish more so than they are right now. I mean, maybe a little more teeth on having to go get a renewal of that permit uh, is probably the opportunity there. I also, you know, there was a suggestion that, you know, the city should be going back into, you know, case and let and looking for, you know, lawsuits and things like that. I, I don't think that's the purpose of the city to be a better business bureau. And, and I really like how Creve Coeur stated it. They do not get in the middle of a private transaction. Mm -hmm. And I agree with their rationale. Like we're not, we're not doing that for auto mechanics or, or barbers or anything else. So why would we do it for homeowners? Um, so I, I think Lisa, you're on the right path on that. But the other thing is I also have a lot of empathy for the neighbors who are not part of that private transaction or just kind of living in it. Right. And mm -hmm. even though it wasn't their choice. So I think what, what can we do to be more proactive on, you know, code, um, you know, enforcement, you know, sidewalks clearing? Um, is it, you know, do we need to budget for more staff to just have dedicated inspectors that are just for new build? And I totally agree with you. So again, when, when I left here in October, it was talking about the length of construction and the second category was what else can we do about these job construction sites? Now I might have unintentionally misrepresented something I said at the last meeting because I know I made a comment like well we drive every day past these construction sites what I what I meant to infer was that we are trained we've got three people that go out um, Monday through Friday and along with any inspections they should always be looking for you know any other um, problems out there and even if you got to go over a few streets, go past that construction site. You're right over that way. So I do think we are being um, more proactive. Um, that being said, though, there, there still are problems. Um, we had we had a situation which I think is not good over on Rosalie. That that is a street now that has a lot of development pressure. When I first got here, it was Lewis. And then it worked its way over to Madge, and now it's, well, it's still Madge, poor Madge, and then Rosalie, you know, we just yeah. got to get this stuff done. And so, yeah, um, Rosalie had issues with just some sidewalks again. The steel plates got taken off. There were steel plates there. It's because open right now. We do right? have, yes, it's not acceptable now. And so, um, you know, we're on it. And um, I think, you know, what I would tell builders is that you need to be proactive. Instead of us telling you these things, you need to figure out what the weather forecasts are gonna be. And if you've got your problem here that you can't get this utility connection done and everything is open up, you need to go ahead and have 
wherever you need to go to get that steel plate, you need to make those arrangements. So all of a sudden, if you have inclement weather that you're dealing with and you can't get it done, you've got your backup plan. And we shouldn't really have to be telling builders this. I, I and, know. And, it, and the faces are changing on every construction site. We go out there, all of a sudden it's like a whole brand new set of people, you know. And I know it's hard to get con to a builder's defense or a general contractor. I know it is hard to find people in construction right now. But nevertheless, that's not the neighbor's problem either, you know, so. But, but I, you know, you can tell a builder that they should go get a steel plate, but that's, you know, they may or may not listen to you, right? That's a soft kind of requirement to them. I mean, the fact is that that sidewalk, you know, was raised at the last meeting. You know, they put a steel plate over it the next day. That steel plate was gone two days later, and it hasn't been back yet. So that hole has continued to be there. You know, isn't that a code violation? Yeah, it, because it does say that you're supposed to be able to keep the sidewalks passable. I would think a major frustration to the neighbors is that, you know, they realize they have to be careful walking out there, right? And we can't always have keep replacing the sidewalk or the sidewalk with concrete, but it's passable. That's something reasonable, a reasonable way to pass on the sidewalk. So it needs to be backfilled. Right. Um, it needs to be tapped down, you know, steel plates, whatever. So, and, and that's not being done in all cases. So. so we have, we enforced the code on that big hole in the sidewalk since the last so, meeting when we were told about it and they fixed it for a day? Um, I don't know that it's been fixed. It's um, not fixed. That's what I'm saying. So they put a steel issuing, plate on it for a day. So we're issuing And citation. the hole is still there, right? So have we enforced code on that? That's a great example, I think, of not enforcing the code. Yeah, the, the, what happened, that particular address, um, the way it originally started, he got an excavation permit to do the water tap. The, the water company said they were not going to do the water tap until the basement was poured on the house it that tap was for the house across the street right um, that's kind of went through a monkey wrench into that whole thing and then we, we called him and said you have to get that covered up that's when the plate went there the plate was removed because 8715 Rosalie on the other side of the street had a sewer tap to hook up right next to that water tap that's why the plate was removed in another section of um, sidewalk was taken out there's actually three different company three different permit applications in that spot for street extent uh, street activations I'm sorry um, the, the other one down there was a water tap issued for a plumbing permit and an excavation permit for water tap there uh, they opened it up the operator hit the corp so now the water company is involved again because the contractor can't work he takes everything from the corporation yeah. um, that is supposed to be done this week they were out there today to finish the the uh, sewer tap which is the third one down the line um, I am going out there in the morning for the inspection and that's going to get backfilled um, I did talk to the contractor on the, the first one he's got the water company coming out there to do the water tap on that one on Monday yeah, I mean, but that's, I mean, that's an example, right? I mean, that's a, yeah. it's a huge hole in the sidewalk and it's been it there is. for a month, right? And I understand it's, it's complicated. And it gets bigger every time it rains. I know, right? And, and I, I'll tell you, I feel for Rosalie, right? I've been walking that every night with my dog and it is always something on that street, whether it's the leaking water main, the hole from MSD, the pod storage thing. I mean, it's just like every day you turn around and there's another inconvenience on that street. I, I really feel for those residents, so. I don't know. I, so, so I don't. So I get, I'm back to my original question. Like, do we need to do something differently so we can be more proactive on code enforcement? Mm -hmm. uh, really, in the interest of protecting the neighbors that are having to live through all this stuff. I mean, should we be well, doing something different or, or put more resources on it? In the budget, the proposed budget. Uh, you want to talk about that? Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just about to say. <laughs> after looking at the budget that we just got in our hot little hands, I've been, yep. uh, Lisa, I think you're hiring another code enforcement officer. She's asking for money. Asking, yeah. proposing. And, and the other thing, I mean, not that this is your problem either, but we have been an inspector down for over a year. Last time we went ahead and advertised, we didn't get any resumes. And that, it's not Brentwood, but it's everywhere. I mean, again, I, I you know, talked to my cohorts in the other towns and 
there are positions in inspection in inspection and building departments that just can't be filled. Again, no, it's not your problem. Um, but I think it has been a little bit of resources. But again, we realize that you know we're being taken to task here, and we take that seriously. We we realize there's always ways we can improve and and do better, and so that's what we're going to do. But resources would help. That's for sure. Okay. So and, and how you know again because. Um, the only way to get their attention, no one wants to come to Monday night court every two weeks, but that's too bad, you yeah. know. So we have issued um, some citations. There's a lot of work just for something that's under chapter 200 for nuisance or under chapter 500. And I'm not complaining about doing the work, but I think probably there's there's more steps to it, um, you know, with trying to find a person's pedigree. I mean, there's just so many things you have to do to just issue that paper citation. So um, we, but we could do better, you know, or, or just. Is that get... something we could help with in terms of ordinance relief to help with those citations? I mean, I, I don't know the steps that it would take, but I mean, if that's a constraint, you know, I mean, making yeah. it easier to do that, is there something that we, the board, could do or start we'll looking at? We'll have to think about that. You know, I, I don't know offhand. Um, do, do you feel like the current ordinances are sufficient for the is is it the, are they sufficient for the nuisances? Is it that we don't that the city doesn't have time to write the or, write the um, nuisance whatever they are it's the procedures. I, or the procedures yeah. or is it that we need stronger code? I, I don't really think so. so. I mean, if anybody wants to get you know just a quick a quick like. What are we supposed to be looking for? It's all in one section of what these job construction sites should yeah. look like. And I don't know, there's 18 points to it or something, you know. Yeah. But you can't leave a commercial dumpster there forever, and you can't put stuff in the road. That's Your fence has to be All up. of a sudden, there's a pile of rock that's in the road or bags of concrete and wasn't there yesterday. And so, um, you know, again, if it, so here's the thing. It's there, but in order... <laughs> If you write a citation for every offense, I mean, really, you could probably, I'm exaggerating, but you could keep two full-time people doing nothing but that, you know what I'm saying? So, but, you know, we need to probably, when we write the citations, make sure we've got everything that's listed on the citations, all the infractions of, because there's usually more than one. If there's one, there's usually more. So, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know how to do things differently, you know, if there's another way to be We've assisted with it. We've had the city's but. special labor council, Stephanie Carr, take a look at our ordinance. So I think it's not an issue with the ordinance. There definitely are areas that Lisa mentioned earlier that we can improve upon. Um, but I, I think definitely the new position will also help. And um, the, the young gentleman that we just hired um, is doing a fantastic job <laughs> in getting everyone's attention. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue to do that and uh, you know, continue to have a conversation about what we can do different. But clearly, the department is aware that there, we need to address this a little bit more. I mean, there would be nothing wrong to be able to say, like, let's say if we've got a dozen single-family construction sites, we should probably be able to make a commitment that we are there every day. You know, we drive fast every day until they're done. I mean. We don't, especially being one inspector down, we don't do that. We know we look for those things in route and, and go out of our way just to look, um, to try to stay on top in, in front of things, but it's a, uh, I'm great. So is this, I sort of feel like if you start enforcing this every time, then the, the contractors are gonna realize, oh yeah, I can't dump the rock in the road. I've gotta put it on the site. And I can't, leave, you know, like if it's every single time, they're gonna say, well, I don't want to go to court and Brentwood's, gonna, Brentwood's cracking down and I don't wanna do this anymore. And so, I mean, it may not help the longevity of it, but at least it, that might help some of the inconvenience to the neighbor's piace. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like when the top, motorcycle cop used to be on Manchester Road. Mr. Trusner. <laughs> I still slow down, even though that guy's long gone. No, but if, if you get a reputation that you're mm -hmm. going to enforce these codes and be hard on these developers, I mean, I go think it goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Lisa, it's nice to write a citation. Am I not correct that in our code, <coughs> you must at least 
send out a letter to the contractor or whatever saying this is what we've seen and we'll give you five or ten days to fix it before I can write the citation? Or can I write a citation upon witnessing a problem? Hmm, that's a good question. I'd almost want, like to answer that two different ways, so that's not going to help any. No, I'm, <laughs> but, I'm, looking, I, I'm looking for how is it that you're managing what you're doing. Do you give the contractor written notice that there's a problem, you need to fix it, or do you give them, here's the citation, this is the code, get it done? Not all the time. If, if it's a um, maintenance violation, they, they'll get a letter first. If it's an issue regarding like something in the street, there, I mean, if you're going to give them a letter to give them 10 days to move it and then issue a citation, the, the point's kind of moot. Um, and on those, we do write one at that at the point of contact. So, when you think, so the plate, the, the holes in the street right now could be immediately cited, cited as this is a problem because I don't want somebody hurt. Get it done within the next two, three days. Yes, sir. And okay. the code that, doesn't say, no, I have to give you a letter and you have to have 10 days before I can take it to the, to the judge to get a citation to get you into a courtroom. I, I couldn't quote a code section for you, but that would really be considered a safety violation and those can be addressed immediately. Thank and you. again, I think we've got a lot of latitude. That's why I was gonna say, well, I could answer that you know, in two different ways. Because again, if it is something of a serious nature, public safety, then we jump on it differently than if it's just uh, something, again, that you could get five yeah. days or what have you. Your, so, your, your orange fence isn't holding up very well. Yeah, our response is different. Um, the one thing, though, that still I think can be um, beneficial, <coughs> just still taking them to court is because even if they could stand there and say, you know, well, it's done now. I took care of it by the time. <laughs> First of all, they can usually, well, I won't go into that, but they can, some of them know how the court system works too and when they really have to appear and when they don't have to appear. Mm -hmm. But when they're finally there, it's <coughs> like, well, it's already been taken care of now. It's resolved. But I, I think we do have a sympathetic judge as well. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean that you still can't be fined for that infraction. It's already, you know, if, it, if you're, found that you have guilt and uh, you know even if you've decided that you were finally going to take care of it you could still be fined so yeah. Yeah, you, you can oh. he does not have to dismiss yeah even if the work is done and a lot of these things too we have the latitude of um, issuing a citation daily until it's taken yes. care of the code written so. that way depending on what you're in And imprisonment, I see in the code, so we can do that too. <laughs> yes. I don't know. Don't have a jail know. anymore. How yeah. It all works. The, as far as the issuance of a summons, it, it does it does take a while. That municipal court summons law that was passed by the legislature changed a lot of the things that we have to do now. It's, it's not like writing a traffic ticket. I mean, we need we need a pedigree. Um, without a driver's license a lot of times we we're not the owner is not present when when we issue that there's no way to identify and the judge was pretty adamant about he needs positive id um, i usually don't get a very positive response when i ask somebody for their driver's license <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and i actually probably don't blame them but uh, i mean we found some other ways to to research that. Uh, we do have some of that information in an occupancy permit if they own the property um, and th things like that. Um, but it, uh, it, it probably takes four hours for us to issue a, four man hours for us to issue a summons now. Hmm. And, okay. All right, Lisa, so you'll come back next meeting with some recommendations on shortening the length of time of these bills. All right. Thanks. All right. Computer. Moving on. I see. What do we got? I guess, Dan, this is you. A discussion on the uh, capital equipment replacement.
Yeah, this was in particular uh, to the sanitation department. Um, so what I tried to do is put together just a real high level executive summary showing what our fleet is. Mm -hmm. I know some of you have seen the trash truck we had like a show and tell several months ago. Um, so if you recall, the one that was up at City Hall is only one of three large sanitation vehicles and we actually have a smaller, an F-250, so a three-quarter ton truck with a small six cubic yard hopper on it. So I showed the organizational chart of all the fleet that we have. Uh, then I actually went into some detail to show you the trucks that we have. Um, in particular, truck one is a 2013 Freightliner. It's got a 25 cubic yard hopper on the back with the rear cart tippers to pick up your trash. Uh, it also can be used for recycling, yard waste, uh, and dumpster collections. There's a cable system up above on top of the hopper. So there's a dumpster at the rec center, there's a dumpster at Public Works. Wherever there's a dumpster that the city owns, we're able to empty it as well. And it's budgeted for replacement in 2023. Roughly the range we think would be $250,000, $260,000 in the year 2023. Truck number two is the one that is up for replacement next year. It's a 2011 Freightliner. It's got the same size hopper on the back, so 25 cubic yard, used for the same purposes, so trash recycle, yard waste dumpsters. Um, as we mentioned, uh, fiscal year 2021, think that its replacement range is around 235, 250. We actually have 235 that's in your budget. And then, Truck three, as I mentioned, it's a 2016 Ford F-250, much smaller, six cubic yard hopper. Um, we use it for anything that's missed. Um, we can also use it for the carryouts. We use it for Brentwood days. Um, basically, it's like a mobile dumpster. You know, it's small, but it can be emptied into the bigger trucks as well. So it can't pick up a dumpster. It's unable to do that, but it can still do the other functions, trash, recycle, yard waste. Um, but since it's a 16, its replacement is scheduled around 2026, uh, roughly 50, 55 thousand dollars. When it was purchased in 16, it was around 43 thousand. So took into account inflation and costs of goods going up. So that's why it's higher than what was in 2016. And then last but not least, truck number four. That one is a 2016 Mac. Is the manufacturer. 25 cubic yard hopper, uh, it has two rear car tippers, basically the same use as trucks one and two, and its budgeted replacement would be 2026, and again, due to inflation, around 260, 270. So that was just to give a high level summary. Um, I know it's in your budget packets, and when we looked at replacing fleet, we had prioritized this, but we also looked at all of our fleet. So, the ones that I wanted to do in 2020, which would be uh, vehicles 76, 71. 76 does not run. That's the one that has a V10. The V10 is no longer made. You can still get the engine. It's just Ford won't. It's not in production anymore, but you can get the engine. It needs a new engine. New engine's roughly $15,000. I don't think it's. I don't think it's wise to put $15,000 in it due to its age, due to its duty. And you know, if you tried to sell it, there's no way you would recover that uh, right away either. And then the other one that we had planned on replacing, truck 71, that's a 1994 GMC. So it's 25 years old. We can't find parts for it whenever there's things that fail, like say your diesel tank on the, or actually it's a gas tank on the side of it, but say it rusts away, you have to go on the aftermarket parts. Maybe you'll find something that sort of fits and have to customize it and make it fit. You know, you can still find some parts on the engine, you know, but again, some are having to be where it's custom. It's no longer that I can go to Al's and pick up certain things, you know, whether it's an alternator or something. So that's why we moved those up to 20 and the sanitation to 2021. And I will admit that truck two has had more issues. I did look at that in comparison to the other vehicles. So it had more repairs in 2019 than the others, but it's the oldest of that fleet. So it would seem logical it would have those problems. And some of the things that were original that got replaced would be the air brake system. That's the most expensive stuff we were hit with. First it was the airlines bleeding air. So then of course, if it bleeds air, the braking system doesn't work because it has air brakes. All those lines were replaced, fittings, everything. 
then a few weeks later, the compressor failed. So without the compressor, I've got good pressure in the lines, but I don't have a compressor that can push the air through the lines. And then some of the other stuff I looked at for truck two, um, what else was there? There was another big one. Oh, power takeoff unit and the mounting pump for the hopper. Those controls help that scraper blade slide back and forth and smash your trash down to get the maximum volume in there. None of that was working. It's like you'd hit levers, buttons, whatever, nothing would work. So that was original. So all that had to be replaced this year. So putting in perspective, you know, if that's, it was built in 2010, it was sold as a 2011, um, you know, that's original equipment. So it's now 2019, it's some nine years old. It's no different than your own personal car. You might have an alternator go out after nine years of use. But this is, an extreme case because with over 90,000 miles and thousands of hours, it's way different than a car because it's being used five days a week and it's idling for long periods. So. Yeah, I think the question originated out of, or by Alderwoman O'Neill, and it came out of Ways and Means the other night. And I guess it was just how you were prioritizing what we needed to do this year. Mm -hmm. And I think even in the last year, or this year's budget, <coughs> you had the first stretch trash truck being bought in 22, you've actually moved it up to 21. To 21, that's correct. And I, so that period of time between now and then, you, you feel the maintenance <coughs> is not going to be that great on that particular vehicle. Yeah, and we also do, uh, it's within this budget and last year's, there's a $10,000 placeholder. So what that's for is if it, there's a catastrophic failure and we need a truck, we can go to Armory Equipment or one of the vendors you have to rent it for a month, and it's it's less than 10, but I wanted to put that in there in case they change their rates. But we could rent one for a whole month, and then you could also do some maintenance on the other ones and rotate. Our problem is, is if you lose two of the large ones, then you're forced to use a dump truck. A dump truck doesn't have a compactor, and we fill it up quickly, go out to the dump, empty, and just keep doing that, and it prolongs the day, and, you know, it's stressful. You know, people expect a certain time frame, I guess, for their trash. You know, we can't guarantee it's always going to be 11 a.m. or whenever you're used to it, but it will be done. You know, and if it's missed, you call us up, we'll write a ticket, we'll take care of it. Okay. Any questions for Dan on this particular item? All right. Okay. So the feedback to... Well, I think, you know, we got a, a vehicle. I would put my kid in a car that was built in 1994 and drive him around in it. And here we are using it to haul two tons of gravel or whatever. Yeah, or or snow, snow plowing. plowing or, yeah. I mean, just from an employee safety standpoint and being out in the public with it, I mean, that thing needs to be replaced. And it would seem to me a priority over a, a garbage truck that we're, we can replace next year with the, the budget oh. we have in, or I'm sorry, in 2021. Mm -hmm. So no action from no. Public Works? Second. Okay. Okay. All right, Dan, I think you're up for this other one, too. Uh, Yes, this is uh, demolition of uh, some of the Brentwood bound. Correct. Uh, the addresses are listed in your um, informational memo. So we have 2940 Mary, 2748 Mary, 8302, and 8304 Manchester, which, even though it's two different addresses, it's technically one Same big property, here. Circo, next to Public Works, and then 8606 Manchester. So we had. Uh, pre-bid meetings, we had the bid opening on the 7th of November. Uh, we did get a total of six bids. So you can kind of see, there's kind of a wide swath there. There's a couple that are clustered around the 300,000 mark, then around the middle fours, and then the way, way into the spectrum in the sevens. Um, the engineering estimate is in there, so that was 642,916, so roughly 643. So of the six, four of them were below the engineer's estimate that the design team prepared. Um, what we did do, because two of these are so close, you can see the cost difference is only 10,860, which is like 3.8%. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to see if there was anything that one had that the other didn't, or that maybe there's some error and omission that they made that they weren't including something in the overall submittal. So we looked at everything with that uh, particular vendor. So we brought both of them in. Navigate was there, Horner and Schiffer and our staff. So we had a group interview with them. Some of the things that have changed, I know I wrote a revised memo and then there's basically another revision to the revision. 
so to speak, because there's information that came to light after certain questions were asked and answered. Um, just kind of highlighting on those. Originally, we were talking about insurance requirements. We weren't sure if um, Schaefer had included everything. Their insurance provider sent a letter indicating that everything was in there. So those are now on even footing between the two, Spiritus and Schaefer. Uh, one of the other things we talked about was air monitoring. Air monitoring actually was included. There's a huge delta between the two for abatement and air monitoring. One's at 44,500, the other's at 22,100. You know, it almost seemed like there had to be a mistake because there's such a gap there. And apparently there is not. Uh, they said they can do it for that price and it will include what is in the specs. And then one of the other things was, um, Let's see. Oh, closed circuit television work on the sewer. It won't be required because it's a lateral. If it were an actual trunk line, you would want to inspect to see if there's any side connections that would be missed. And it's too late to go back if you fill it full of grout or something. So, But because this is a private lateral, there shouldn't be any side connections. So it's not a requirement per se. You know, it'd be no different than your house should connect directly to a trunk line. Mm -hmm. You would hope your neighbor doesn't tie into it if they did. <laughs> that's a bigger problem that will have to be resolved. So after meeting with the two lower bids, even though it's not the lowest bid, you guys are more comfortable with uh, Spartus? We were more Spiritus, comfortable right? with Spiritus in the sense that they have more experience working in Missouri. So Spiritus is based in Missouri. They've done a lot of industrial and a lot of commercial demolition. This other group, uh, Schaefer, they're based out of Pontoon Beach, Illinois. They've done a lot of work in Illinois. And we did actually get some letters after the the revision memo was written, so there was actual recommendation from a contractor that worked with Schaefer. Um, but Spiritus has more experience with local utilities. You know, they've done, again, majority of their work in Missouri. And then they also seem to have a better concept of safety in the sense that they have a safety compliance officer, a competent person. You know, they actually know what their insurance rating is and things like that. It really becomes, you know, do you want someone with more experience from Missouri or do you want to take a chance on someone from Illinois that probably can do the work, but there's this $10,860 difference. So. I'd entertain a motion to forward this on to the board in the form of a resolution, correct? So moved. Do you, on the consent. Yeah. Do you know which one that you would want or you're wanting to say, bring it to them? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm just going off this recommendation. Of okay, so spirit is, okay. I will second the motion. All right. Any questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. All right. Anyone opposed? All right. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Move on Thanks. to citizen comment. Anybody from the audience want to come up and say a few words? Come on up. I have forgotten. You'll have to excuse me. I'm sorry. Just state your name and where you live. Ah, thank you. My name is Jacob Goodwin, and I live over on Helen, 2468 Helen Avenue. Uh, first thing, just that I, I, I think it's interesting with the uh, storm water runoff and the drainage. Uh, in Glendale, we did a huge project there, and I don't know if this was researched or, or found out, but I really liked what they had us do when it comes to a storm uh, uh, runoff water mitigation program. They had us uh, test the soil in the lot it, to, an engineer had to do this to tell us what the percolation rate is. I probably per have this perk wrong. Test. Okay, perk, perk test. test. And then they, uh, if it didn't meet the requirements, they had us bring in soil, uh, which I thought was great because it was inexpensive. Uh, it did not put a, a big uh, stress on the budget. Uh, or the timeline at all. Uh, I probably shouldn't be talking about timelines, but it was a really good, uh, it was a really good measure. The other thing they had us do in this, in this engineering package that we did is they had us uh, have the engineer uh, looked at the size, the footprint of the house and the circumference area, do I have that right? Surface area of the roof. Mm -hmm. And so based on that, uh, in uh, comparison to the or in relation to the lot, they had us appropriately sized, uh, appropriately sized gutters and downspots, yes. which I thought was awesome. Uh, two additional things they did that I, th or maybe three, we had to 
uh, turn in a plan for uh, showing where we were going to have downspouts, uh, where we were going to dump water, and how far out we were going to take it. And I thought that was awesome. Uh, the other thing that I think was great is they did have us, uh, how do I say this? Turn in a, create and turn in a schematic explaining and showing what were we doing, what we were doing around the foundation uh, uh, with some pumps and where that water was kicking out as well. So, but, but none of that stuff was really expensive. It's something we probably keep in our heads anyway, other than the, other than the soil remediation. Yeah, the perk test, not a lot of people keep that in their heads and think of doing it, but it's stuff that they required us to do that I thought was a good idea. I think m most builders would want to do that. Sure. Uh, okay, next one. The, uh, the regulation of uh, builders, myself being one, uh, and what we're not doing right on job sites. For the past year and a half, I've probably been one of the worst offenders, and I apologize for that. I, not going into full detail, got myself into a huge mess, which I'm working through. I have too much work. And, in, and I'm working through it uh, with a much smaller crew to try to uh, make my processes more smoother and uh, come into compliance with the city more. But here are the things I do like. I like the fact that Steve calls me all the time and says, Jacob, this is going on. You got to fix it. It's, if I don't, I'm, I usually like to be the first person to tell on myself and call the city and say, hey, you'll notice this is going on. We're on it right away. This is what we're doing about it. But in the event that I don't and I hear from someone from the city of Brentwood, I think not only is that good for any, any contractor or builder um, to get that notice because it's a warm notice inviting someone to, hey, come do this, I'm calling it to your attention. Let me tell you what's going on and what, what has to be fixed. And I think that's a great idea for people. Uh, the other thing I, that I like, I, I can't say I love it, but I did get my first three citations, I think. <laughs> and those actually, uh, you know, kind of, uh, how would I say this? I, of course, I'm going to show up, but now I know Steve's real serious. I'm not just, you know, I'm not his friend, but I know Brentwood's serious. So. I think those things alone do help a builder or a contractor. I unfortunately learn things the hard way. I don't know what I don't know, but these will make it stick. So I think those are great ideas. Um, I'm all for, believe it or not, I might seem like an enigma. I'm all for the year permit. You got a year to do it. And uh, you know, for under reasonable circumstances, a six month extension, I have some problem child projects that I'm, I'm past the year on, uh, but I still believe and think that it's a great uh, practice to say, hey, you've got a year, and then you have a chance for an extension. Uh, because they are expensive, uh, these projects. Nobody really wants to be in these projects that long. And they are uh, hard on uh, relationships in the community, and they're, they're, they're hard on neighbors. They're hard on everybody. So I, I'm all for those. I'm, my only request would be, if you do actually make a rule, could you call it the Orin rule, or the Orin timeline? That, would be, that might be helpful, sorry. Um, I think that's it. Um, but I, I think those are all great ideas. And I, I'm very much so interested in the stormwater mitigation one. I think that's a big deal. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. No. Aye. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Calling you. Oh, she's not sending me.